Welcome to the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit. These weekly podcasts feature expository messages delivered to edify the soul. Now let's join Pastor Dave as he presents this week's message. So if you take your Bible and join me with in uh, join me in 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians. I'm going to say that all day, okay? Let's just let me just put that out there. I'm going to say 1 Corinthians. It's 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles chapter 5. I will get it right, hopefully, before the end of the message. 1 Chronicles chapter 5, and I'm going to begin my reading in verse 18, and we'll read down to verse 26. But before we do that, I'm so proud of you this week, because you read through the genealogies here in 1 Chronicles. That's not easy to do. And you know... (laughs) I've read somebody who said uh, that this should not be a common devotional practice for the believer, but that we need to do it every now and then. And it's so true. The, the history here is outstanding, and it's important. Because what we have in First Chronicles is, is almost like a wireframe for the entirety of the history of the Old Testament. And I say that because if you look at, for example, chapter 1, how do we begin in chapter 1? Adam. Then you look at chapter 2. So this is a 30,000-foot view of this, okay? Adam begins chapter 1. Who begins chapter 2? Chapter 2 is Israel. So we go from Adam to Israel. And then who begins chapter 3? David. So you notice how we go from Adam to Israel, so somewhere in there was Abraham, and we were narrowing down our focus. Then we get to Israel, and we're going to talk about all the sons of Israel, but then we come in chapter 3 to David, and now we're going to talk about David. Where are we headed with this? We're headed to Messiah with this. So the entirety of the Old Testament is a story about one family, and you'll notice that when we begin there in chapter 1, it's Adam and then Seth. So we're following Adam's line through Seth to Israel, that is Jacob. So Jacob comes from Isaac and Isaac from Abraham. Abraham had two sons. We're not going to talk about Ishmael. We're going to talk about Isaac and his boys and Jacob. Jacob had a brother, Esau. We're not going to talk about Esau. We're going to talk about Jacob, Israel, and Israel's 12 and their children, But then we're going to come to chapter 3, and we're going to talk about Judah's descendant, David, and just David's family. And so the history, the, the motion, the flow of this genealogy is about one family, and we continue to narrow and narrow and narrow. Now, there are lots of other men, and there are lots of other families, and there's lots of nations, and there's lots of kingdoms, and all of those genealogies are wonderful and marvelous, but here in the Bible... We're going to follow one family, and we're going to see where they go. And then in chapter 4, we have the sons of Judah. We're going to talk more about Judah and and those descendants. And then we come to chapter 5, and we're going to talk about Reuben. And so in in these remaining chapters, we have Reuben, we have Levi. We're going to talk more about all of these sons of, uh, of, of Israel. In chapter 8, we come to Benjamin and his family, and then in chapter 9, we're back to uh, Israel again. So you see, we're, we're focusing our attention, especially on certain ones, and that's the whole idea. As I say, it's a wireframe for the entire history of the Old Testament. Now, we've had the pleasure, actually, of reading in the Old Testament all the stories that are built upon this wireframe of a genealogy. So we're, we know about Abraham and his life and his stories. We know about Isaac and his life and the stories about him and the teaching there. And we know about Jacob and all of his travails. And we know something about some of the sons of, um, of Jacob. And, and because we've read those stories, well, now we come to First Chronicles and we kind of stop, take a breath, and then we read all these names. And they're all recorded for us. And you know something else that this this genealogy reflects? It reflects the Lamb's book of life. All of these names, we don't know who they are, but God does. 
All of these names, we don't know what they did, but God does. And they're recorded in his book, just like your name is recorded in his book. Denise and I were talking about this yesterday, and uh, we were having a conversation over dinner about all of these names. And, and she said to me, and I was, I was thinking one thing, and she was on a completely different page, which was the best page of all. And she said, well, you know, one of these days, my name will be forgotten, but he'll know it, and it's written in his book. And I thought, well, there it is. There it is. One day somebody's going to be reading about Denise and all of her travails and all of her victories. You know, it's a, it's, it's wonderful that we look at these names and I I don't know any of these people. I mean, you just look at some of these names and Azuba, who's Azuba? I don't know, but God knows Azuba. God knew him when he was alive and he knows him yet today. So these names, although for us, on a devotional level, it seems very bore, very, very boring, kind of dry. You know, it, like I was, I was telling somebody this morning, I think it was um, Alan and Carolyn, I was reading and I would read an entire passage and then I would get to the bottom and my mind had checked out. And I was reading, but I wasn't comprehending and I got to the bottom of the passage and I was like, what in the world did I just read? Because all those names, they just sort of, they kind of dull the mind because you don't know them and they're hard to say and they're hard to read. And then you get to the bottom and you're like, wait a minute, I just, I know I missed something because I just read 12 verses and I don't even remember any of what I read. So you have to go back and pick things up. And usually when I do that, that's when the Lord says, okay, well now I'm going to show you what you really should see here. So there's so much here. There's so much good stuff here. And also... Let me just say also, um, did you notice how many mothers were mentioned in the genealogy? How many ladies are mentioned in the genealogy? And how important they are to the genealogy? So many moms. I think that, that it would be a wonderful little exercise just to go through just the first nine chapters of Chronicles and just record the names of the moms and see how they correspond to, to the stories that we've already read and how important they are. Because, you know, it's true what they say about the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Those moms were influences upon all of the names that we have here in the passages. So I think that would be a wonderful study. I didn't do it for the sermon today, although I was tempted to. I was very tempted to because there were a couple of ladies' names in there that I thought, oh, that might make a really good sermon for us because we get so tired of reading about all the guys and who they fathered. And then there's a mom in there, and it's like, oh, that must be significant if the mom is being mentioned. But instead, I chose today chapter 5. We're going to begin in verse 18, and we'll read verses 18 through 26. The sons of Reuben and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, of valiant men, able to bear buckler and sword and to shoot with bow and skillful in war, were four and forty thousand seven hundred and three score. They went out to the war. And they made war with the Hagarites, with Jether and Naphish and Nodab. And they were helped against them, and the Hagarites were delivered into their hand, and all that were with them, for they cried to God in the battle. And he was entreated of them because they put their trust in him. And they took away their cattle and of their camels 50,000 and of the sheep 250,000 and of the asses 2,000 and of men 100,000. For there fell down many slain because the war was of God. And they dwelt in their steads until the captivity. And the children of the half-tribe of Manasseh dwelt in the land and increased from Bashan unto Baal Hermon and Sinir unto Mount Hermon. These were the heads of the house of their fathers, even Ephraim and Ishi, Eliel, and Azariah, and Jeremiah, and Hodaviah, and Hadiel, mighty men of valor, famous men, and heads of the house of their fathers. And they transgressed against the God of their fathers, and went a whoring after the gods of the people of the land, whom God destroyed before them. And the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Pul, king of Assyria, and the spirit of Tiglath, Pileser, king of Assyria, and he carried them away, 
even the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and brought them to Hala and Haber and Hera, under the river Gozen, unto this day. I'm going to entitle the message today, The Blessing and the Downgrade. The Blessing and the Downgrade. On the eve of the Southern Baptist Convention, we find a cautionary tale in 1 Chronicles about the dangers of allowing blessing to morph into nightmare. We are on the cusp of dissolution in our denomination because we haven't guarded our hearts or policed our own leadership to prevent the horrors that have been allegedly committed. You'll notice that we begin with blessing here. There in verse 18, it says, The sons of Reuben and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, of valiant men, men able to bear buckler and sword and to shoot with the bow and skillful in war. Now first you'll notice that it says they are able to bear. These men were physically trained. To handle a weapon rightly, you have to spend time with the weapon. The word translated here, able to bear, comes from the root word, which means to lift up. These men had trained their bodies and their minds to be able to lift and hold and use the sword, shield, and bow. They were able to pull the bow and shoot with accuracy. They had done their due diligence so that they could take up the weapons in defense of their people. They were able to bear the buckler and the sword. And as I think about that, you know, that word, that Hebrew word, which means to lift up, <clears throat> I wonder if in my, in my age and in my lack of conditioning, if I would even be able to lift the sword and the buckler. I mean, I could probably lift it and hold it, but to use it in battle you would become exhausted very quickly. But these men, these were valiant men. These were men who were able to do that. And it also says that these men were skillful in war. They were, I would like to suggest, they were studied in war. The word translated skillful is from the root word, the root verb to learn. They were studied in the art of warfare. This too takes time. The martial arts of strategy, logistics, and timing, etc., must be learned if the battle is to be successful. If you send a bunch of able men into battle, it's one thing, but it's just chaos unless they're organized, unless you have a plan, unless you're able to skillfully manipulate those men so that the battle can be won. These men were not only able to bear buckler and sword and to shoot with the bow, but they are also skillful in war. They had learned about it. They were studied at it. Now, let me just pause right here to say that we, too, are to be able and studied. We are to be abled and studied. What a blessing for any home that that has an able and studied man as a husband and a father. What a blessing for a city, a state, a nation to have able and studied men in the positions of leadership. For too long we've suffered fools and sluggards to occupy places of leadership in our country. Fake degrees and fake friends have taken the place of ability and knowledge. And dare I say that not only in our homes and in our, in our country's social structures and political structures, but also in our convention, we have allowed fools and sluggards to occupy places of leadership. But not only is this a call for us to have able and studied men at the helm, but it's a call for each one of us as Christians to be able and studied. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7 and 8 says, Refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable unto all things having the promise of life that now is and of that which is to come. I would submit to you that this is a call for the Christian to be able, to be able in spiritual disciplines, to be an able man or woman in prayer, to be an able man or woman in devotion, to be an able man or woman in worship, and in, what other, and in all the other ways that the Lord might lead you in your spiritual practice, to be able 
practice and exercise yourself in godliness. Secondly, again, Paul writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It is a call upon us, everyone, to be studied. Yes, we're to be able in godliness, but we're also to be studied in it as well. And the place where you study about godliness and righteousness is in the scriptures. It's given by inspiration of God and is profitable. We too must be able and studied if we are going to be a blessing to our church, to our home, to our society, to our neighborhood, to our communities where we live. Able and studied. This is a call for every one of us to be men and women who are valiant and ready for fight. Not a physical fight, but a spiritual fight. Not only did they have the blessing of valiant men, but they had the blessing of faithful men. You notice that it says there in, uh, in verse 19, they made war with the Hagarites, Jether, Nephish, and Nodab. God had given them a warrant to push against their neighbors and take the land that was promised to the tribes. Now, we know the time of this engagement because we're told earlier in the chapter in verse 10, where it says there in verse 10 in chapter 5 of 1 Chronicles, In the days of Saul they made war with the Hagarites, who fell by their hand and they dwelt in their tents throughout the, all the east land of Gilead. So we know that it was during the time of Saul that this battle took place. And we know who the Hagarites are. These are the Ishmaelites. Hagar was the mother of Ishmael. And so the Hagarites are the Ishmaelites. And Jether and Nephesh and Nodab, even though we don't know who they are, we know now that these are the leaders of the Ishmaelites in this day, in the time of Saul. Isn't that interesting? All the things that were happening during the time of Saul with the Philistines and all that Saul had to deal with and with, what was the fellow's name? Um, anyway, that, that, that battle with him and Jabesh Gilead and he came on Jabesh Gilead. I think he was an Ammonite maybe. And uh, all of that's going on at this time during the period of Saul. And of course then Saul chasing after David and all of that upset. But during all of that happening, you have these three tribes on the east side of the Jordan. And what are they doing? Well, they're taking land. They're doing what God promised that they could do. All that land is theirs. There are people there that are living on it. All they have to do is push them out. And so they're doing that. And these people that are living in that land are the Ishmaelites. And so they're going to push out against them. But the Ishmaelites, these Hagarites, have a mighty army, a mighty army. And so they're up against it. They really are. They're beginning to grow and to spread, but then they're pushing up against these neighbors who don't want them to do that. So then this battle occurs. Yeah, so the Ishmaelites are there. People, they're part of the descendants of Abraham, but they have no covenant right to the land. Only Israel does. Remember what David said to the giant he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that would defy the armies of the living God? He had no right to do that. They had no right on their land. God had given them that land. And David knew it. David knew there was a covenant promise. And that's what David's faith was based on when he stood before that giant. That God's covenant promise would prevail. And so we have, we have Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And they join together in a confederacy. And they say, you know what? The Lord has promised this to us. We're going to take it. And that's how they did it. That's how they went about it. These were men of faith. And they knew who their helper was. You notice that it says there, they needed help there in verse 20. They were helped against them, and the Hagarites were delivered into their land and all that were with them. Now, I want to tell you a little story on myself. I'm reading through this passage this week. And I come to chapter 5. This is before I was even going to preach on this passage. I, I, this was prior to that. And I came to, I came to this verse in chapter 5. And I read verse 20, that very first part, they were helped against them. And I thought to myself, oh, I wonder who helped them. I wonder if another tribe came up and helped them. 
Who, was, who could have helped them? And I read that, and they were helped against them, and the Hagarites were delivered into their hand, and all that was with them. I thought, isn't that wonderful? Somebody came, and they helped them. And then the end of the verse, they cried unto God in the battle, and he was entreated. And I'm like, oh, come on. Come on, David. You know better than that. They were helped against them. Yes, because who's our helper? We know who our helper is. Do I look under the hills? No, I will look unto the Lord from whence my help comes. And that's what these men, as I say, these are men of faith. Not only are they valiant men, able and studied, but these are also men of faith. They believe in the promise. They believe in the God who is their helper. And they needed help because the Hagarites vastly outnumbered them. Now remember, verse 18 said, there were four and 40,703 score that went to war. Okay, almost 45,000 men. That's a lot of men that go to war. All valiant, all skillful. Got that. But if you have 45,000 men that go to battle and you're facing an army of multiple hundreds of thousands of men, you might be the best warriors in the world, but the odds are against you. They're way against you. Five to one against you. So, they needed help. They were helped against them. Well, they, they sure did need it. So you'll notice in verse 21, we read it, but we'll get to it in a minute, that the men that were left over that they took into captivity were 100,000. That's just what was left over. So they were facing quite a host. These are the men that are left over. The original battle group must have been huge, could have been well over 300,000 men. Not only are these men men of faith, not all these men do they know who their help is, where it comes from, but they're also men of prayer. Men of prayer under difficult circumstances because there in verse 20, they cried unto God in the battle and he was entreated of them. Men who were men of prayer under difficult circumstances. Matthew Henry wrote this. He says, quote, So ready is he to hear and answer prayer. They were helped against their enemies, for God never failed any that trusted in him. In the battle. I love that. That little phrase right there in verse 20. For they cried to God in the battle. Now, I'm sure they prayed before the battle, and I'm sure they were trusting in the promise before the battle, but... They also had the faith that in the midst of the battle, when it looked overwhelming, when everything seemed like it might be lost, what did they do? They didn't moan and complain. They got down on their knees and they prayed, Dear God, be our helper. Now look, I've been in some dark days in my life, and I know something about dark days. It's Dark days want to obscure the face of God. And sometimes in the midst of a battle, you, that's not your first thought. Praying is not your first thought. Sometimes we just want to revert back to our own ability, our own cleverness. How can I get out of this situation? What do I need to do now? No, but these men, in the midst of battle, facing overwhelming circumstances... They did not blush from prayer. They went right to it. They prayed in the midst of the battle. And the Lord, in the battle, heard them and was entreated of them and gave them the victory. So you can just imagine all of this happening on the same day. They go into battle, realize they're overwhelmed, pray and cry out to God for help, and he does a work right then and there. Wow. Wow. Don't you love this picture? So when the battle is the hottest, ladies and gentlemen, we have a tendency to cry out, but not to God. We're quick to cry out about our disappointments and fears and doubts and make sure everyone knows about our suffering, but not these men. No, they prayed. What a marvelous, marvelous example they are. And what a blessing. So they're blessed... This, this group is blessed because they have able and studied men, and this group is blessed because they have men of faith, men who are not afraid to pray. And we're told why they're not afraid to, to pray. 
Because there in verse 20 it says, because they put their trust in him. Their trust is seen in the prayer. Why else pray at the darkest moment? If you don't trust the Lord, you're not going to pray. You're not going to cry out to him. Their trust and faith is seen in this. They they just make an altar right there in the battlefield. And it's a witness to everyone who sees it. And it's a witness to God. These men are the same ones who built an altar after the... uh, conquest of the land because you remember that Moses said to the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh you're going to go ahead of the of your brothers and you're going to march into the land all of your men of war are going to march into the land and you're going to help them take it and when that's done you can go back home and so when they went back home you'll recall in Joshua chapter 22 they built an altar they built an altar on the east side of the Jordan and when the children of Israel saw that the Gadites and the Reubenites and so forth had built that altar, they decided that that something must be wrong. Maybe they've gone after another god, and so they had this little conference. If you notice in Joshua chapter 2, verses 26 and 27, they say, these men, Gadites and the Reubenites, say, let us now prepare to build us an altar, not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between us and you and our generations after us, that we might do the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings and with our sacrifices and with our peace offerings, that your children may not say to our children in time to come, ye have no part in the Lord. That's how concerned these men were about the future. They wanted to set something up as a witness that this is who we are, this is what we're going to do, we are going to serve the Lord and him alone. Faithful men. What a beautiful, beautiful picture this is. Even though they had faithful and valiant men, men who were abled and studied, we see in the passage a shadow of the downgrade. It's on the horizon, but it's there. Something happened that replaced the able, knowledgeable, and faithful leadership. We see in the aftermath of the battle the conditions that led to the corruption of the blessing. The conditions of the the downgrade then are very plain for us to see. And let me just say something about that word downgrade. I use that, I've used that in my title. I've used it again now in this part of the sermon. In the 19th century, the Baptists of England were having a struggle over theology and over ecclesiology, that is, how to run the church. And Charles Spurgeon, who was pastoring at that time and was a member of the, um, of the Baptist group there in England, he wrote in his paper, The Sword and the Trowel, about the downgrade that was happening. And that's his term. He coins it. He calls it the downgrade. And let me just, I brought with me, This little book, I also want to recommend it to you. It's called A Marvelous Ministry, How the All-Around Ministry of Charles Haddon Spurgeon Speaks to Us Today. And it's uh, it's actually sort of a compilation because there are several articles in here and each one by a different author. And during this downgrade, um, Spurgeon had a lot to say about it. And part of the the downgrade was this, and I'm I'm reading now from, from this article about the downgrade controversy. In the life of the churches, and I'm quoting now, in the life of the churches, doctrine tended to be depreciated in favor of winning the masses for Christ. Does that sound familiar? Stress was placed upon practical Christianity with the implication that doctrine was relatively unimportant. There was a growing unwillingness to define the gospel It was said that Christ must be preached, but few stopped to ask what sort of Christ was being proclaimed. The Christian life was increasingly separated from Christian doctrine, it being assumed that doctrine did not really shape experience, but rather that doctrine was but the formulation of data provided by Christian experience. Thus, experience tended to be made the norm, whilst doctrines, however greatly they conflicted, were viewed as insights based upon experience. 
The emphasis, the emphasis was shifted from what God had revealed to what man could formulate. And ladies and gentlemen, we are facing a downgrade today as well. The same thing is happening in our convention. It's one reason why I wanted to preach this message today, actually why the Lord gave it to me to preach today, I'm sure, uh, because this downgrade is happening amongst us today, and we've taken it even a step further. It's not now that it's not now that everything is about evangelism, but now it seems in our convention, evangelism has been used as a cover for the crimes of wicked men who are in the leadership of our denomination. And so I think if we look at what happened with the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, we will see the conditions of downgrade. And once we know the conditions of downgrade, maybe we can be on our watch against them. So the very first condition of downgrade here in our passage is the blessing of victory. This is how downgrade always begins. It begins with victory. These things were going well for the people. The victory was a boon to their prosperity. And you notice the list here in 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 21. They took away their cattle, it says, of their camels, 50,000, and their sheep, 250,000, of the asses, 2,000, and of men, 100,000. Prosperity was good. Things were great. They had a lot in store. Second condition of the downgrade is the favor of God. Looking back, they saw that it wasn't their actions that won the day. No, because they were overwhelmed by a superior in, before a superior enemy. Verse 22 says, There fell down there many slain because the war was of God. And so they were celebrating what the Lord had done in the past. And that's a good thing, but it's also something that we should be careful about because it can lead to complacency. When we continue to celebrate the victories of the past, we forget that we have a future that we need to guard against. We need to guard our future. Thirdly, the third condition of downgrade was they had a lot of peace. Peace for living was a part of what they had. The rest of their time up until the exile, it says they lived in the land. There in verse 22, it says, and they dwelt in their steads until the captivity. They were right there. They had all this land. They had won it in battle. The Lord had given it to them through that battle, and they continued to grow and grow and grow, and they experienced a great deal of peace. And so the, with the peace came complacency. Fourth element or condition of the downgrade is their increase. They became wealthy and prosperous. It says the children of the half-tribe of Manasseh dwelt in the land, and they increased from Bashan unto Baal Hermon and Sinir and unto Mount Hermon. So all the way north, on the east side of the Jordan River, as you go north, all the way up through Gilead, all the way up past the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, all the way up to Mount Hermon, which is the northern part of the land, that is where they're increasing. All that property now is theirs. And so they're experiencing this promise and the increase, but the increase while it's a blessing, is also not just a boon, but it can be a trap because people are becoming complacent, thinking that they're, you know, they, they're deserving of all of this prosperity. And then finally, and I think maybe the worst of all, is that they're led by the famous. You notice there in verse 24, it tells us about all these, and I won't read the names of the heads of the houses again, Ephraim and so forth. And it says they're, they're mighty men of valor, famous men. Anytime celebrity is elevated in an environment of prosperity, peace, and favor, and victory, well-meaning, able, studied men can and do become compromised because they want things to remain the same. The word translated famous here comes from the root word uh, that means name, generally translated name, but here it means famous. It also can be translated renowned, well-known. Their past reputation was imputed for current morality or spiritual condition, which, of course, had changed for them over time. These are the conditions of the downgrade. All of these sound like wonderful things. All of these are things that we would want, but we must be careful of them because what happens next tells us that they're not always fertilizer for godliness. 
because we have then the horror of downgrade in verse 25. They transgressed against the God of their fathers. What do all the conditions of the downgrade lead to? They lead to transgression. Once we break away from the anchor of our soul and think that we can replace it with worldly wisdom, pleasure, wealth, fame, peace, and security, sin becomes the replacement instead. This is what happened to these tribes. This is the same language that Isaiah uses because he says, and here notice that it says there in verse 25, they transgressed against the God of their fathers and went a whoring, a whoring, notice that. They went a whoring after the gods of the people of the land whom God destroyed before them. Isaiah uses this very same language. On Wednesday night Bible study, we noted many weeks back how Isaiah uses the imagery of the marriage covenant and the marriage bed to describe the sin of false worship. He says there in 57, Isaiah 57, Upon a lofty and high mountain hast thou set thy bed. Even thither wentest thou up to offer sacrifice. Behind the doors also and the post hast thou set up thy remembrance, for thou hast discovered thyself to another than me, and art gone up. Thou hast enlarged thy bed, and made thee a covenant with them. Thou lovest their bed, where thou sawest it, and thou wentest to the king with ointment, and didst increase thy perfumes, and didst send thy messengers far off, and did thy base thyself even unto hell." This is always the scene when we worship other gods. And so these people, because they had been led into such prosperity and they replaced their God with their prosperity and with their pleasure, they go whoring after other gods. And it just becomes open, just open sin now. But I want you to notice something. In the midst of this horrible condition, the mercy of God, because all of this is happening between the, the time of Saul and the time of Tiglath-Pileser. So there were 300 intervening years between when the battle happened and when Tiglath-Pileser comes and takes them away. 300 intervening years. This describes for us the long suffering of God. It was during that time that the victory and the downgrade happened. It was during that time that these men who were blessed with ability and who were studied and who were valiant and who were faithful men morphed into something less. Their sinning didn't happen right away. It came on in small increments, bits, piece by piece until they were in a full-blown a whoring after other gods. But our long-suffering Lord waited for them to flee their sin and return to him. He waited 300 years until the right foreign king was ready who came with God's plan. Don't think, it's, don't think it to be a, a marvelous thing that Tiglath-Pileser had decided and all the Assyrian kings had decided that deportation was going to be their rule of thumb when it came to conquering another kingdom. They did that all the time. But guess who that's from? That is not their plan. That is the Lord's plan. Because he suffers long-suffering Mercy waits for these people until a king, come, king comes who's going to carry them away. Because they were not destroyed and wiped off the earth. The memory of them to be forgotten forever. No, they were carried out of the land. Carried out of the land. Not that it was easy or pleasant, but it was the plan of God to preserve his people. And they carried them, it says. Even the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. God is so merciful that we are even told where in Assyria they were taken. We have the cities, Hala, Haber, Hera, the river Gozan. And, and for the writer at the, t at the time that this is recorded, it says they're there even today. So they knew exactly where they were. So God's not done with them. He's going to bring them back, and eventually they will come back. And they will come back in repentance, and they will come back and they will reoccupy the land. One day it's going to happen, and it did happen, and it happened because of God's mercy. So even in the midst of the horror of downgrade, even in the midst of all that happened to these people, the merciful God waits for them, and then he carries them off to another place, 
And he leaves them there in that place, and he knows exactly where they are. And one day, they're all going to come back. And they did during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. So how do we apply this? Well, first of all, I think that we must say that ability and knowledge should be things that we strive for, especially in the Christian life. An able and studied man is eminently capable to lead both the home and the community. We need able and studied Christian men. We need able and studied Christian women. These must be the ones who lead us. Secondly, prayerfulness, even under the harshest conditions, is a boon to any family, church, or individual. This comes only when we have set ourselves to seek the Lord, and as it is said of the Gadites, Rumanites, and and a half-tribe of Manasseh, those who trust in the Lord. They trusted in the Lord, therefore they prayed. They trusted in the Lord, therefore the Lord was entreated of them. Their trusting, ladies and gentlemen, is something that we should emulate. We should set ourselves to seek the Lord's help in every circumstance, no matter how dark it may seem. And I know that in this congregation, there are folk who have experienced great darkness. I know that. And I encourage you, in the midst of your darkness, cry out to him. And watch what he does. Thirdly, watchfulness. Victory invites the devil, always has, always will. He seeks to mar the image of God, and so he, bit by bit, takes good things and uses them against God's people, and that is exactly what has happened to our denomination. We have been blinded by our victories. And fourthly, we we must seek the mercy of God. When the horror of downgrade is the greatest, He is long-suffering and the greatest at that. And he will always provide a way of escape. He waits for us, ladies and gentlemen. He waits for us. He waits for us to come to him. So, what should we do? We should come to him. According to his mercy, cry out to him when the battle is hottest. Jesus will meet you. Thanks for listening to this week's message. Please join us again next time for another installment of the Creek Road Baptist Pulpit.